All right, everybody, welcome to Talking Trout. It's another first Wednesday of the month, eight o'clock. We're ready to go. Um, we got a great speaker lined up. We got Kyle Zempel from Black Earth Angling Company, uh, somebody who I've, I've spent a little bit of time on the water with. I had the pleasure of being at his crash camp. Um, he's, he's got an, an incredible fishery in his backyard and he's got it really dialed in. Um, and, and some of you may not know this, Vaughn, but Kyle is actually a, a really amazing photographer as well, um, something that he does professionally. So he's going to kind of meld the two tonight and, uh, and give us a little taste of or a little peek inside of both worlds. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Kyle. All right. Well, uh, yeah, this is certainly uh, uh, a di you know different time right now. Uh, we all uh, can't be meeting face to face, uh, but it but it allows people and, and me to talk to to more people from their homes, which is kind of great. So, um, I, I certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to to talk to you all. Um, so, a little bit of background about me, if you don't know who I am. Um, I, I own uh, the company Black Earth Angling Company in, uh, I live in Black Earth here just west of Madison. Um, and actually I, I kind of cut my teeth and in in, got into the fly fishing industry um, through photography before I actually started um, doing any guiding or anything like that, uh, well before I had had a guiding business. Uh, so um, that's kind of where my roots are as far as uh, fishing goes. You know, the, the, two, the two passions kind of grew hand in hand I, uh, you know, I was able to, you know, spend a lot of time on the water um, and had a camera with me at all times and, uh, you know, kind of use it as a platform to, to uh, blend my two passions together. And uh, it took me some, some really cool places. So um, I'm going to share just a little bit of a presentation for you guys tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, you can, you can throw them in the chat. Um, We'll, we'll go through uh, some, some answering some questions uh, towards the end. Um, but uh, I think I'll, I'll kind of share my screen here and we'll, we'll go on with my, my presentation. Maybe. There we go. Okay, so the first thing and the question I get all the time is, what kind of camera do you use? Um, and I, I'm here to tell everyone, it really, really, really isn't about the equipment. Um, I, I think uh, if, if you think it is all about the equipment, you're kind of missing the point. Um, you know, as, a, as someone who wants to take good pictures on the water, uh, sometimes carrying a big DSLR camera around is not um, conducive to, to fishing and maybe the pack that you have. There's a lot of great technology out there now. You know, the, the thing that we all carry around in our pocket, a cell phone, those cameras are fantastic. Um, and they continue to get better and better and better. Um, so uh, I, I find myself carrying just my cam my 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 cell phone camera um, more and more um, as they advance and leaving my DSLR back at home just because it's this big clunky thing to carry around and um, not as convenient to pull out of my pack uh, to get a, a photograph. But uh, you know, I'm just going to go through a couple pictures. These are all just cell phone pictures and you can see they, they turn out really, really well. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing that these cameras really can't do um, that you could do with with a DSLR. Um, some of the advantages, obviously, with something with a, with a longer lens, that you're going to get some depth of field, that kind of that blurry background. Um, but now we're seeing technology kind of take on that route as well. And I think there's like the portrait mode in the iPhones. Um, those things are great to use when you're taking, you know, uh, fish photographs. It'll help you kind of blur out that background, give you that really cool effect. Um, but ultimately, um, don't be don't be afraid to, to take what you have and use it. Um, it's more about the subject matter and, and, and having a good eye um, than it is kind of the, the amount of money you spend on a camera. So uh, I wanna get that one right out of the way right off the bat here, because I know that's probably the question I get the most. And uh, you know I wanna kind of uh, nip that one in the butt right away. So 
my big question is, what do I use? So um, again, like I said, I carry my, cam my, my cell phone with me a lot and I use that um, a lot on the trout streams. Um, I'm over water a lot more. When, I, when I'm in a boat, I tend to carry a DSLR a lot more. Uh, I use, I've just been a Canon person, not for any specific reason. That's just what I started with and was used to. Um, I have a, uh, I think right now my camera bodies are a Canon 6D and a Canon 60D. Um, I have a 5D in the bottom of the Wisconsin River somewhere with a lens on it. Uh, so I, uh, I've lost a few good cameras and, it, and just realized the more you spend on the camera, the, the more it hurts when you, when you ruin it and drop it in water. So uh, if that's any um, <laughs> motivation to, to use what you have, uh, uh, go that route. But uh, the, the biggest thing I think, um, again, I can give you a little insight because I know people are going to have questions about equipment. Um, I think the biggest thing is don't necessarily invest in the camera bodies. If you and I'm talking specifically DSLRs here, where you have a separate body uh, from the lens itself, um, spend more on the lens because the lens is generally going to last a lot longer. It's something that's going to be compatible with new bodies that come out. The technology in the bodies is is changing so fast you can't keep up with it. By the time you buy a camera, they're already working on you know two cameras ahead of that. Um, so you're just never going to keep up with that technology and have the newest and greatest. Uh, so invest in glass. Um, I use uh, my favorite lens I use is a 24 to 105. Uh, it's an L series lens. Um, they're expensive, um, but I've had it through all the different camera bodies that I've, that I've uh, owned. And uh, it's kind of my do all be all uh, lens that I use, I would say at least 90% of the time I travel with it anywhere. If I had to take one lens on any trip, it'd be that 24 to 105. It covers a large range. It has got some zoom and it's got some wide angle and you can get kind of close and get some macro shots. It kind of just covers all bases. And, um, I'm not a person to really like to stop and like switch out lenses and take the time to do that. So I like to kind of like have my one thing that I like to use. Um, you know, it, it can be, you know, it's, it, it's nice to have the one, two punch of like your DSLR and your cam or, and your, uh, your iPhone or, or your, excuse me, your, your cell phone camera. So, but next we're going to go into the hero shot because again, everybody wants, uh, you know, that really awesome looking shot on the water. Uh, I think this is kind of one thing that everybody, um, again, another very, very popular question that I get is, you know, how do you make your fishing pictures look so good? And again, everyone kind of wants to say, oh, you must have, it's a good camera, so I must take good pictures. And that, that is the farthest thing from the truth. Uh, good cameras can take good pictures, uh, but you have to have the eye and have the understanding of what you're doing uh, in order to get those good pictures. Um, so one of the, some of the things, you know, as a guide, I'm on the water all the time and I'm, you know, people are catching fish and, um, you know, if I took a picture of every single fish that came out of the water, um, I'd be spending a lot of time, you know, just taking pictures and not actually fishing. Um, so a couple of the things I like to ask myself is, is what is it worth, right? Is it worth, um, you know, taking this fish's life to get this picture? Uh, because I've seen guys, you know, it's the catch of their lifetime and they throw that big, nice trout up on the bank and it rolls around on the dry grass and it, it, it's just not a good situation. You know, so you have to ask yourself, what is it worth? You know, if, if you're not in the position to get a good picture, you know, is it worth, you know, killing that fish to get that or potentially killing that fish to get that picture, right? Uh, so those are some of the things we need, certainly need to ask ourselves. And, and some of the insight I have um, while I'm guiding is, is it a milestone fish? Is it a first fish? Is it a unique fish? Those are kind of the three things. Um, if it meets one of those criterias, I think, um, you know, it's worth taking the time, taking the picture. And, uh, you know, we're, we're out there. We're, we're, our, our main goal is to put these fish back, back most of the time. And uh, I think that, um, you know, we, we just got to th be thinking about what uh, we're, gonna, we're, we're doing out there. So we, I'll talk a little bit about you know, getting good hero, hero shots as we go through this, uh, but but I kind of want this thought process to be in the back of your head uh, going forward. So I don't know if anyone's heard of Keep Them Wet. Uh, I know they recently um, maybe changed up their name a little bit, but um, if you if you go under the you can go to their website, 
I think it's keepemwet.com or something like that. And uh, it's got a lot of great information about, you know, kind of uh, good ways to photograph fish and um, has a lot of great information, a, a lot of great data actually studying, um, you know, the effects of having the fish out of the water, th these types of things that, that you may be interested in. So check that out. Uh, I try to follow some of their principles. And uh, this is kind of the, the three big ones here. Uh, minimize air exposure, eliminate contact with dry surfaces, and reduce handling, right? Uh, I think the, the biggest one is, you know, you should have that fish uh, in the water as much as possible, leave them in the net, uh, and uh, that's where they belong. And when you're going to take that picture, bring it out of the water, take the picture, get it back in the water. Uh, and this eliminate contact with dry surfaces. That includes your uh, winter gloves. Uh, you know, we as guides, I think, are trying to help educate people that you know, if you do catch a trout during these cold weather times, uh, to and you're going to handle it, take that glove off. Number one, it's no good to have a soggy glove the rest of the day. So just pull that thing off. Your hand dries, and you can you know you can dry it off on a towel or whatever you want, and put your your, your dry glove back on. That's much more pleasant for the rest of the day. Uh, but touching a trout with that that dry glove is not a good situation. It's not good for them. They have a protective coating on uh, uh, on them, and once you remove that, that opens them up to you know, different types of diseases uh, that can ultimately uh, be fatal to the fish. So. Let's make sure that we're using wet hands and when we're, when we're handling fish. And again, ultimately just re handling as much as possible. Um, I understand, you know, like we're out there, we're trying to catch the biggest fish of our lives or have a good time. And you know, part of that enjoyment is, um, you know, getting a picture with that fish of a lifetime. So um, these are just some things to keep in mind and things that I try to keep in mind as a photographer and someone who's, who's photographing fish quite often. So this is uh, probably what a lot of our, 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 uh, our, our pictures look like if we go through our cameras from different trips we've been on. Um, and I put this one in here for a great reason. I, I'm sorry to, to Mark if he's here, but uh, this, is a, this is an oldie but goodie. And uh, you know, there's nothing too interesting about this picture, right? Okay, this, you know, this is in Bear Trap Canyon in Montana. Um, I can't, that doesn't do it. And, uh, and Mark caught this nice rainbow and, uh, you know, it, it's probably the biggest one he had caught at that point while we were on the trip. And, you know, if you go to show someone this, they're going to be pretty unimpressed. Um, however, I think, it, you know, it goes to, I'm trying to point out here that, that it's, it's not always about getting a picture with the fish, right? Sometimes it's about the fish itself, right? And so I captured this photograph right before this one right here of him with the fish. And I think we can all agree which one looks a lot better. I'll go back to it, right? <laughs> I mean, they look like two different fish. Um, when it's out of the water, the sun's hitting it really badly. The color kind of went away. And um, when it was in the water, that fish just came to life. Now, if I want to put one of these things on my wall or show somebody a picture of, they're going to be much more interested in this one versus this one. I think I might have another one of these here. So going back to uh, a milestone fish. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, work in the San Juan um, National Forest at a zip line that was out there. Um, no road access. You had to use the, the, the narrow gauge uh, steam engine train to get there um, out of Durango, Colorado. And so it was a very unique place. I got to live out there for a number of summers and live right on the Animas River and have endless amounts of fishing to myself. And, and really, Mark was the only other guy I was fishing with out there. And uh, we didn't really know what we were doing. It was really early on when I first started fly fishing and we went up this, this little creek and uh, saw that there was some, some brook trout in this little creek. You could see them swimming around there and, and we tried bringing our fly rods in there, but it wasn't, you know, it, it just, it was too tight and too, you know, too bushy to, to use the rods. So we ended up just breaking sticks and, and just dapping dry flies and catching these little things. And uh, this is one of them you can see, I mean, you know, I've made these mistakes as much as anyone else. You can see this fish has obviously been dropped. Uh, it's dry. It's, it's, you know, he's getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. I think you can see a mosquito by his left ear there. 
uh, it's just not that pleasant of a photograph, right? It doesn't capture what was actually happening there. And this was, it was like these, these brook trout out of this creek that you could, that we literally could fill our water bottles up and drink the water out of, right? Uh, again, doesn't really uh, capture the whole story here. Uh, so I think it's important to kind of think about that and, and to tell a story. And then I captured this picture of this fish uh, prior to catching it. And again, we'll go here or we'll go here, right? Which one's more interesting? And sometimes I think we, we have to think, you know, if we're out there, uh, you know, with, with a, a photographic mind, it's not always about, you know, after catching this fish, it's about the story leading up to it or maybe the story after it. Um, but this one is much more appealing, you know, uh, it kind of makes me think of fresh, clean water. It's nice, you know, gin clear water. You can see uh, the fish plain as day in there. And uh, this story takes me right back to that, to that spot, that clean water that you could drink and, you know, dapping fit, you know, dapping uh, dry flies to these, these silly brook trout that have probably never seen a fly before. Uh, so it kind of brings me to my point, think outside the box a little bit. I think that's, that's ultimately the biggest thing I can, I can send you with um, is, is get outside of just that classic, hold the fish and take a picture, right? I mean, some of you, that's, that's what you're after and that's okay. Uh, but but I know a number of you out there um, may be more interested in, in you know, maybe a more artful uh, aspect of it or a different way of looking at it where, you know, the, you maybe bought a nice camera and you, and you want to use it and take really nice pictures that you could potentially hang on the wall. I can look around my house right now and I don't think I really have anything that's, that's you know, kind of blown up and in, in, in a prominent place on my wall. Uh, of me holding a fish or anyone else for that matter, holding a fish, right? It's always something, you know, a little bit more unique. Um, so, you know, think underwater, you know, a number of these point and shoot cameras are really awesome. They're waterproof. You can put them underwater. You can get some really cool shots. Uh, one thing on that, if you're taking notes, um, if you want to shoot underwater, it needs to be clear water and a sunny day. Um, if it's stained water, there's a particulate in the water, that's why it's stained, and the light does not pass through that particulate. So you'll end up with real cloudy pictures or no pictures at all. Uh, so if you are taking photographs and you wanna take some good underwater ones, you need clear water and you need sunshine. Um, macro, right, getting close. What are those, you know, um, we've all seen a brown trout before, but like maybe that brown trout you caught had some, just the most beautiful adipose fin, right? Focus in on that. That's the important thing you want to capture. Not, you know, again, you're going to catch more brown trout in your life than you can count and remember. Uh, what makes this one special? Why do you want to take the time to handle it extra, to take it out of the net, to take a picture of it? Is it because it is big? Is it because it's beautiful? You know, ask yourself those questions. What about this fish is something that I, that I want to capture? And then some of the details, right? Um, I think one of the things I, I kind of, I didn't want to go too deep into, but but telling a story, right? There's so much more uh, to taking photographs on the water than just the fish, right? Um, I think we all like trout because they generally take us to beautiful places and uh, that there's some of those things that need to be captured as well. So don't always think just of the fish, think about your surroundings. Um, I think uh, Pete Kozad uh, once told me, that he makes sometimes will make his uh, his customers uh, stop while they're fishing, and 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 turn around and look all around them, and it's, he calls it the driftless 360, um, and to take in your surroundings because sometimes we get so focused on the task at hand and that's catching fish that we forget to look around once in a while. So uh, it's a it's a good point to take a break once in a while, look around your surroundings, um, and and maybe photograph some of that. So just some, some outside of the box photographs. I think this is a brown from uh, Castle Rock Creek uh, during the summer months. I think it's got a big foam bug in his mouth there. You know, this tells a story to me, right? We were, you can, it tells me when it, when it happened because there's a big foam bug in his, in his mouth. So probably, uh, you know, during terrestrial season, uh, that fish is super colored up. So probably, you know, maybe September, October, later in the, later in the season when it starts, those fish really start to get their beautiful colors. Um, you know, this, this tells a story to me. Here's a nice macro shot. I talked about macro shots. Um, one thing I think once you start to shooting some macro stuff, you'll realize how many colors are on a, on a trout. I mean, if you look at this, and it is just absolutely stunning 
the different the detail that's that's going on in here. And this is just a fish's eye, right? There was nothing special about this fish other than that I had gone into the day with the plan that I wanted to take some macro shots of, you know, a, a fish's eye, maybe some of the fins. So with each fish I caught, if it, you know, had if it had some good looking colors on it, I take the time. You know, this is actually, it's really helpful if you have someone else with you to, to help hold the fish. Um, but a lot of times you can kind of hold them. You can see this fish is actually still in the water. Um, and I just brought the eye out of the water to get the photograph. Um, again, you know, am I handling the fish a little bit more? Yes. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'm keeping it in the water and I'm going to release this fish in the end of the day. So again, this isn't, you know, this is, this is not a, a hero shot. I could have, I don't think we took a shot, uh, a photograph of this, this particular fish, um, but we did get a really, really cool shot by kind of being ready because we know that smallmouth bass like to jump. And so kind of, you know, I was ready at the helm for when someone hooked one and it, you know, came after it and, and, and ate a fly really aggressively. And I was able to capture that. That again, to me, tells a story. It's something that's outside the box. Again, I've got thousands of pictures of people holding bass and, and you know, um, I'll send those to, to my uh, customers and then that's probably the last time I'll ever look at them. Um, you know, these are the ones that, that I save and I, I give the, that extra little star that, you know, goes into a separate folder for me to go through um, and, uh, you know, and look at. You know, and I will also mention, um, brings up a good point. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to have a number of my, my photographs published I'm regularly in the Fly Fish Journal. Um, I've had the cover shot of Eastern Fly Fishing, uh, I've been in the Fly Fisherman, and I um, believe the Drake, uh, you know, a number of these, these publications. And really, none of them are looking for those hero shots or rarely they are they looking for those hero shots they're looking for something interesting um, and so these these to me are, are are those those images i would submit uh to these magazines and and would have have the potential of getting getting uh, published again here there was you know similar day where i was kind of going out i was i was going to say i'm not taking pictures of any full-on fish um, I want to take a picture of something, you know, unique about this fish, right? This brown trout had some beautiful yellow, yellow belly with a really nice prominent white line on its, on its fin, just something I wanted to capture. And this also goes um, hand in hand with, well, let's, let's just say if I'm fishing alone, uh, these shots are much easier to get than, you know, trying to set up my cell phone or something to make, to get a selfie of me holding this fish. Um, if that's the case, if you catch a lifetime fish, the best thing you can probably do is put your cell phone on video, set it up, and then hold the fish up for the video for two, three seconds, and then put it back in. And a lot of times you can, sc you can, you can sc uh, screen capture um, that image, right? That's kind of the best way to do it if you're by yourself and you don't have a lot of experience doing it and you really want to get a photograph of a you know, milestone fish. But when I'm by myself, this is the type of photography I'm usually going after. I'm taking, you know, shots of fins and eyeballs and small insects, that type of stuff. Again, here's here's one of my favorite photographs of a, of a smallmouth bass, right? Uh, they, you know, you call them the red eye and it, this thing looks like it's got fire in its eyes. Um, it's just, again, super, super unique and you know, really, really capture something, draws you in. It's something that you really, really would want to like, you know, hang on your office wall or something. I don't know if you put it in your living room, <laughs> but uh, it, it's certainly something that uh, it is, is uh, an image you, you'd want to, you know, frame. Here's some water, water, underwater shots, right? This is no special, you know, 45 inch pike. I think it's, you know, I would say it's probably above a handle ha hammer handle, but it, but it, you know, you put it underwater in a situation like this and that, that medium sized fish, um, you know, totally becomes this awesome image, right? Um, you don't always have to go out and catch this big fish to put on Instagram or on Facebook, you know, as long as you're, you're kind of taking a unique approach to it and taking interesting images, people are going to want to look at them, right? Um, you know, so many of the stuff, the content that I put out, 
isn't the big, you know, oftentimes the biggest fish I catch, I try to get back in the water as fast as I can because I want it to be there um, so I can potentially, you know, catch it again or it can get bigger. You know, I'll take some of these images of these, you know, kind of, you know, mid-range fish that you catch a whole bunch of and there's a lot of in the, in the river system. Um, and I capture them in an interesting way, which allows, you know, people to say, wow, like, look at that. And then they admire that photo, not because the fish is big, but because it's an interesting photograph. Here, here again, baby tarpon, right? Um, this is just, in, it's, a, it's a classic, you know, shot of that, 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 that uh, dorsal fin of the, of the tarpon. And this is probably one of the, the first photographs that really got me any attention. I think I won a, a, a big uh, photo um, contest with this one. And uh, it actually, I think it's, it's a little skewed here. I think the, the dimensions got messed up on the, on the screen, but um, you know, this is again, it wasn't, you can tell by the distance between the two fins on this brook trout that it wasn't anything enormous. Uh, but again, it's, it's a very, very interesting photograph, um, you know, to look at. So we will get into a little bit of some tips and tricks here. And I'm gonna kind of go over some of the, um, the, 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 the catching the fish part of it and then what to do once that happens. Um, some of these things kind of go hand in hand with the keep them wet um, principles. Uh, so, you know, I think the biggest thing if you're, going to, if, you, if you're going to be out there photographing fish, you want to reduce angling duration, right? You get those fish into that net fast. Don't, don't overplay them. We know this, right? Um, this is something that is constantly preached to us um, and, it, and it does make a difference. These fish, um, if they're overly stressed and then you want to take a photograph of them, you know, you're stressing them on top of them already being stressed from a long fight. So put the stick to them, change your rod angles, get these things into the net. Carry a net, right? This is an oldie but goodie photo down here. I had to put it in there because I, I, I had a good laugh at this one. Uh, so you spend all this money on this really fancy net that I see, you know, I, people come fishing with me and they, they get this nice expensive fish pond net that's, you know, $100 or whatever. And uh, they catch a fish and they bring it up and, you know, they grab it with their, their gloved hand or something like that. Like you, you have this nice net, use it. Um, obviously rubber netting is best. And, uh, you know, back when this photograph was taken, I don't think rubber netting existed. Um, and so does length really matter? Uh, and I'll get into why I have this in there. Um, I, I prefer kind of a longer handled net and I'll, I'll show you why in a moment. Um, and one of the things I do is once that fish hits the net, before I just go right into photographing it, I'll let it like kind of recoup in the net, right? Get it in the water, usually some faster moving water. So it can kind of recoup a bit before you start handling it to take a photograph. So this long handled net, if you take a look here, what's going on, right? I will take my long handled net and we're lucky enough that, you know, a lot of our banks around here are kind of soft uh, or they have some vegetation where you can actually take that long handled net and just kind of jam it in to the bank. And, or you can kind of angle it down and if it's a soft bottom, angle it down a little bit into the ground so that it kind of sticks in and you can be hands-free, right? This is really important for a number of reasons. Number one, it creates basically a little live well for the fish that you just caught and that you want you plan to photograph. Now you can be hands-free, you can get, you know, dig around in your pack, get your camera out, all while that fish is in the water and not flopping around on the bank, right? We, you know, if you're putting that fish on the bank, you might as well, you know, on, on the dry grassy bank, you, you might as well just take it home with you and eat it. Um, so, you know, you can do this with a short handle net as well. Um, but the idea here is that that fish stays in the water while you're trying to kind of get your shit together. Um, you know, because if it's a big fish, you're going to be excited. You're going to be flustered. Um, use this trick. This trick I use all the time. Uh, I use it, you know, on the, on the river for smallmouth. I use it um, all the time for trout fishing. It's a great, it's a great technique. Um, and uh, allows the fish just to kind of recoup while you are, again, hands-free and can, can dig around and get your stuff together. The net can also act as a really, really nice, you know, um, piece of your photograph, right? It creates some really, really beautiful composition if used correctly. 
Um, again, this fish has got his face in the water. Um, you, know, you can see it's drizzling a little bit. I think this is actually a brown off the brule a number of years ago. And uh, I, you know, it just kind of laid there real nice. I'm like, well, that before I try to pick up and you know, get a picture of this fish that's too big for me personally to hold out away from my body to get an actual picture of that's gonna look crappy anyways. Um, I'm gonna take a picture just like this and, and let the thing go. And again, here's another picture of a, of a big brown and uh, this one's in black and white. The, the, you know, that rim of the net just really, really looks nice and creates a really nice contrast. I think, um, again, it, it can be part of your photograph. So Master Barb, um, I know there's a lot, you know, people will say it doesn't make any difference. Um, I'm here as a guide to tell you that it does make a difference um, and, I've, and I've seen it happen. And, and maybe not so much just getting, you know, handling time, but as far as uh, fish mortality goes, it definitely makes a difference. Um, and, and I'll tell you why this, this, if we can look at the, these two fish here, whoops, a daisy. Um, these two fish are the same fish. Um, it, unfortunately you can't see it here. I, I, I knew it was the same fish, but if you look at the tail fin on the right, you can see that it's got some, some like, you know, cuts in it. Um, this was the exact same fish. I'd seen this fish take, take a hook deep and it was bleeding, it was hooked in its gills. It was a barbless hook. I was able to slide it out without ripping it out. Once there's a barb in there, that thing's not coming out easily, right? It's, it, has to get, it has to rip out. And it, it removed, it basically fell out on its own. The fish was still bleeding. I put it back, revived it, let it go. And about a week later, ended up catching that same fish again. And I've had this happen numerous times to me um, where, you know, maybe it's a, it's just this hidey hole in the river where I know you cast there and every time you catch the same fish. And sometimes that fish eats it real hard and it's bleeding and you hook it in the gills. And that's where that barbless hook really, really comes into play is when you hook them deep, um, that, you know, removing that hook is, uh, is, is, is kind of the, the thing that'll, that'll do, do the fish in. So um, if it's real hooked real deep, just cut it. Um, if you, especially if you have a barb on there. Uh, I have actually caught fish, especially bass with like, uh, you know, the line and hook um, coming out of them the, on the other end. So it, it does work, but uh, mash your barb. It, it makes a difference. Carry forceps, again, this is something everyone has them packed in their, in, I always see people with them packed in the back of their pack or in their backpack, like that does you no good. Um, again, this whole thing is like, we wanna get a picture of these fish and if we're planning to put them back, we want them to be back, you know, alive. Uh, so have these things ready to go, right? Have them clipped on somewhere, have them in your front pocket, have them, you know, all these waiters have a front pocket, have your, your forceps in there, that's where they, that's where they belong. Uh, and I think that's all I need to say about that is, is uh, don't keep them in your backpack where it's hard to get at them, have them, have them at the ready. And this will all, again, reduce the amount of time that fish is in the net and in the time that will uh, you take to, to take a photograph. So it's all kind of ties together. And handled with care. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the things, um, I guess uh, Luke Kavichek, I don't know if anyone knows who he is. He, he guides up on the Schwamigan Bay and, uh, you know, was kind of mentored by uh, Roger LePenter. And he told me this great story um, about a time where he had caught a small bass and he kind of just unhooked it and, and chucked it back in. And, uh, and Roger stopped him and, and corrected him and to, to tell him that basically, you know, you need to handle all of these fish as if they're, you know, a 20 inch bass or a 20 inch trout because that, that fish could, could be that one day. And if you just, you know, because it's small, you don't handle it properly, um, that's, that's not doing us any good for the future. Uh, again, big thing, wet hands. Um, we can't stress that enough. And then hold them over the water. Uh, again, that, that little net trick uh, where you stick the net in, I usually, if I'm having someone um, get a picture with their trout, I like them to straddle that net with that, that, that net kind of between their legs and then the, they can reach down in the net, get the fish and lift it out of the water. And if it flops, they can just drop it right back in to the net and then try again. Um, usually, you know, we, we get it on the first go, but you know, we're human and fish are slippery. 
So <clears throat> the secret to uh, it's kind of a formula, I guess, as you can put it, uh, for a good hero shot. Um, first things first, this is again, that, that whole net in the bank thing where you can let the fish revive is really nice um, to allow you time to talk it out. Um, it's, it's much easier to get a, like your, your, you know, your hero shot uh, of a fish if there's two people. And the first thing you wanna do before you do anything is, is kind of talk out the situation. Okay, can you hold the net? and hold the fish in the net. Um, I'm gonna get my camera out. I want you to take a picture of me with this fish. You know, um, have a plan. There's, a, I always have a plan when I'm gonna take a photograph of a fish. Uh, it's, it's certainly, you know, something that'll, that'll improve your, your, uh, your handling time uh, dramatically. It'll, it'll reduce it, I should say, dramatically is by having a plan and what, you, what you're gonna do. Uh, when we hold the fish, we want to hold the fish out away from the body. Um, you know, I know people make fun of, of, of folks who have the, you know, the fish way up here. Um, but again, we want to remove it away from our body. We're big, huge things. And the closer we have the fish to us, the smaller it's going to look. Um, so we want to remove it away from our big body and our big head. <clears throat> and uh, that'll help the fish look true to size. This is one thing that I, I see uh, people make the biggest, make the mistake most commonly is uh, they don't get level with their subject. So this is a, you can look down here at this photograph I have. The, the photographer here is getting level with the subject, right? He's, he's, he's actually below the guy's face. Um, he's even, he's, he's almost even with that, that fish. And uh, that'll really help you give, get a good perspective on the fish and you'll get that nice, uh, looking shot if you're even with the person. <clears throat> I'll show you a, sh a photograph later of someone who does not get level with it. And uh, we can go back to that one, uh, the first one I showed you of Mark. I was kind of standing above him. I took a shot down and just this little tiny fish mostly covered up in your hand and it doesn't look interesting at all. So make sure you're getting level with the person holding the fish. If they're down on their knees holding that fish, you get down on your knees and maybe even lower, right? You can get slightly lower than the person's eye level. Um, the the perspective is going to look much better. So make sure that is something that you do. And then we're going to fill the frame. So if you look at my screen right now, and my my face is not filling the frame, right? I have a lot of distraction over here. Um, when when we're taking a photograph of that fish, fill. Okay, so the person has the the fish out here. We wanna move the camera closer to the person or the fish until it starts to fill the frame, right? So as I move closer to my camera, I'm becoming more and more prominent, right? And, and the distractions over here are going away. So uh, when we're taking pictures and someone's holding that fish, move in until most the, the fish fills up most of what we're seeing on that screen, right? We wanna fill that frame and that's gonna make that fish look really nice. Because again, I think it's about the fish here, uh, not about necessarily the person holding it. Again, this, the, the long handle net, that thing comes in handy. And then where's the sun? Um, we want the sun at the photographer's back. Uh, we do not want it at our subject's back. The person holding the fish, if the sun's at their back, um, they're gonna have a, a, a blacked out face and the fish is gonna be probably pretty shadowed. Um, if it's a bright sunny day, it's best if you just try to find a spot, again, with, keep that fish in the water, find a spot that's kind of shaded, where, where you and the fish are both in the shade. Uh, when sunlight hits a, a, a wet fish, it tends to blow it out a little bit, um, which can, you know, make it look a little, little off. Uh, if we can get into the shade a little bit, um, your photograph will turn out a little bit better. Uh, rainy days. Um, or cloud, I shouldn't say heavily raining, but, but you know, days where we've maybe had some rain and then, it, and then it's overcast following some rain or leading up to some rain. Overcast, overcast days are really good, um, especially if things have been wet, uh, to, to photograph fish. Uh, the sunlight reflecting on them, again, is really, it becomes really harsh and uh, oftentimes can, can blow, out, blow out the fish a little bit. So, um, you know, a little cloud cover, a little shade goes a long ways. So again, this is not 
a very, very appealing photograph. Um, this was like, a, you know, a nice, I think it was probably like a 17 inch brown I caught in Utah and my buddy took the picture and I'm like, boy, this is awful. Um, and I said, do you, do you mind if I show you a few things? And so I'm like, I'll take a picture of the next fish we catch. And so I caught the next fish, but I made him hold the, hold the rod and everything. And uh, you can see here, I'm talking about filling the frame. Look around me. There's like, there's all sorts of space and just noise, right? Left and right of, of me, you know, it just, there's, you know, you got my fat gut in there. Like none of, none of that stuff is important, right? We want to get in on that fish. So if we look at it right now, we fill the frame with, with, a, with a person, the, the angler, and that fish, right? There's not so much noise all around us, right? If I would have, if I would have been back, you know, 10 feet, this photograph would have looked as boring as the last one. Uh, again, I, I saw, he held the fish out. I, as the, I, as the photographer, I moved in until everything kind of filled the frame nicely and snap, got the picture, fish goes back in the water. Um, I will also talk about going, you know, with with a plan here. Uh, this is this is a, a really really nice fish we caught when I was in Chile, uh, and you know the 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 goal here was we wanted some of that really dramatic like dripping water off the fish. Um, you can't, you know, your your fish should look wet when you're taking the image. That means you're doing it right. That means that you're keeping it in the water. So he held the fish in the water. I said, okay. Again, this kind of goes hand in hand with making a plan. Ready, one, two, three, he lifts it up, snap, 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 and then the fish goes back in. And you can do it maybe a couple of times if you need to, um, but having that plan and that fish was in that water the whole time. I, oftentimes, I, you know, someone wants to take a picture and they hold the fish and they wait and they wait and they wait and they wait until the person kind of gets, gets the camera all set. You should kind of have the camera ready to go with the fish and lift it up, snap, back in the water. So again, having a plan is really key. And this is kind of a, you know, it's, it can be hard hold, holding our, our, you know, quote unquote, smaller trout uh, of the driftless area. Um, and I found this is kind of a nice way to do it. Uh, you, you know, you don't want to wrap your hands all the way around them. Basically, you, the fish is in the net, you go in there and you use kind of the pads of your, your fingertips with two hands to go under the belly of the fish using, using the palms of your hands to kind of tip forward, not like this, but tip forward to turn that fish um, to the camera. And uh, this is kind of the best way I found if someone wants to photograph of one of the, the, the trout around here that aren't these big two hand things that you can, you can kind of handle uh, a little easier, right? These are these small little things that can easily be covered up with your hands. I think the best way to do it again is kind of two, you know, pads of the fingers on the belly, tip your palms forward and uh, move the fish out towards the camera. Um, you get a decent shot anyways. And again, this is, this is one where uh, I, I overexpose things a little bit here. Um, you can see the sun is obviously at this guy's back. Um, and, and one thing I, I, sometimes you can, if you, if you, if it's not really important about the, the fish itself um, and you just kind of want to get a picture to document a trip of someone holding a fish, something that makes, can make it a little bit more interesting is um, putting the sun at the subject's back where you get some light passing through, you know, the fins and you can see it's passing through kind of the mouth a little bit. Um, it kind of can, can add a different look to, um, you know, the, the photograph and make it a little bit more interesting. So something to try once in a while. And again, here's just like, you know, these are just shots from, from people I've guided and uh, you can see that that net is right there at all times. Um, whether they're standing and reaching down into that net to grab the fish out, um, you know, kneeling, swatting, like it's that kind of that net's always there to kind of catch that fish if something goes wrong. And uh, that prevents us from having to bringing the fish over the top of the, the dry land to get that photograph. Uh, again, we, we want to kind of, if we, if we happen to drop that fish, we want them to go in the water, not on the rocks or the grass. Um, so hold those fish over the water. Can't say that enough. 
And some some last words here. Uh, small fish equal big fish. Treat the small fish as, as, as you would the big fish. Um, if we treat them well, uh, hopefully they will grow and become those big fish. Um, you know, while you do this, you know, I, I think Facebook can be a real toxic place. I've noticed in those in the forums, and you know, I think everybody wants. It just seems like there's just a lot of anger and and hate that that happens in those forums. Uh, people are human, and fish are slippery, right? There may be someone who posts a picture of a fish on a bank, or maybe it looks like it had fallen in the dirt. Um, we're, we're all human and the goal is to do it better next time. And uh, I think we need to um, kind of be understanding with, with, with people when we see those photographs. Um, you know, it's, I could easily um, go on those forums and be like, you're doing that wrong and you're doing that wrong and you're doing that wrong. And that really doesn't help anything. Um, I, I try to be more constructive than that. And, and say, hey, uh, here's something to think about. Maybe try it this way next time. Um, it, it's better for the fish and here's why. Uh, and, and maybe maybe provide those people with some, some, some information as to maybe why I shouldn't be wearing my gloves while I'm holding those fish in the winter. Another thing about winter fishing, if it's uh, you know, below freezing, below 30, 32, 33 degrees, uh, those fish need to remain in the water as much as possible. Uh, their gills will freeze almost instantly uh, when we take them out. So I usually don't take any pictures uh, of, of any fish in the winter when, when, it's, when it's real cold out. If there's ice forming on your guides, you know there's ice forming on their, on their gills. So just keep that in mind. Um, I will keep my, the fish in the water as I unhook them and, and let them go. And then lastly, um, again, uh, tell a story, I think is the most important thing you can do. Um, and we can all tell our own story and, and have our own unique ways of doing that. Um, just some, some different imagery here that isn't all focused on fish. So this is like one of my, my favorite storytelling images right here, right? Uh, it had been pouring rain in Chile and we were just kind of getting our butts handed to us. And, you know, the conditions were awful and we were just working, 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 and without a bite. And, you know, you travel these, when you travel to fish, if, if you haven't, uh, there is this like looming pressure that you need to catch, you know, something and you need to catch that big thing that you went there for. Uh, so uh, this moment here to me was, was just like, it captured it so perfectly. Like it, it was just like celebration. I'm in a different boat. We drove, the other boat drove over because we saw someone with a bent rod and since we all stopped fishing to kind of celebrate this moment of this fish. I mean, this fish wasn't anything special in comparison to what was caught on the trip, but it was one of the first fish that was, I think it maybe was the first fish that was landed. And it was, a, it was, a, it was a, like, it was a milestone moment, right? It was worth capturing. And instead of just taking a picture of just this fish, uh, you know, it's kind of important to, to realize that you know, when something big happens, there's usually smiles and laughter and, and facial expressions that go with that. And, and to be kind of on the ready to capture some of those, right? Uh, if you see your buddy maybe sliding into a river and into a precarious spot where he may fall in, it might be an okay time to point a camera at him and kind of wait uh, for the reaction of him falling in or something like that. Those images are the ones that, you know, uh, magazines are looking for and that make really, really good, interesting content. This one right here, under the elements, right? Um, this was a super snowy day, um, and it, you know it was. It's just, it's just a. It really takes you into the the, the elements, and and uh, you know takes you to a place where, you know, it, it, yeah, it's uh, it brings back a lot of memories for me, and I don't need to dwell on those. But uh, it's, you know, sometimes those bluebird days aren't the best days to have your camera on you. Sometimes when, when it's raining or snowing or it's foggy, those are the days where you're going to get those really dramatic images. So on the, and, and some, some thought process for you on the days and in, in when we have those kind of um, different types of abnormal conditions, maybe it's foggy, maybe again, it's, you know, there's a lot of frost. Uh, on the trees. Those are the days where I'm, I'm kind of carrying a camera more than I'm, I'm, I'm looking to fish. Um, and it's nice to go fishing with people so that they can fish and you can kind of capture those moments in those really, really neat settings. Um, I think 
on that same note, uh, those early morning sunrise times of the day and those evenings, those, that golden light, kind of that, that last hour of light, those are times where I generally don't do a lot of fishing myself because I, I, I want to have the camera in my hand. That, um, I think if I can give you uh, another piece of advice as far as getting good imagery, it's, it, so much of it is about light. Um, shooting at, at high noon, um, the light is not attractive during that time of day. It's very high straight above you. Uh, think about your ceiling uh, in a room with like fluorescent lights, right? It's just, it's coming straight down. It casts weird shadows on eyes and it's just not that pleasant. It's not dramatic. Um, when, the, when, the, when the light is at the, at the sides, right? So morning and evening, that's when you're gonna get your most dramatic light. And that's when you should spend most of your time taking images. A lot of times if, if, you're, hitting, if you're hitting like super good light, um, you can take a picture of anything and it's gonna look good. Uh, I mean, that's that's kind of the, the best time to be out and taking photographs. Again, something telling a story. This is actually, whoops. No, oh, I'll go back to that one. Uh, this was a day where I had gotten skunked. And, um, but I found this cool box. Uh, Barry, I, I stepped on it. Uh, while I was walking through um, the long grass. I mean, if this belongs to anyone, please let me know. I'll return it to you. I still have it. Uh, but, you know, it was, uh, it was just something interesting, right? And that, it kind of made the day for me. I didn't catch it. Again, I, I got skunked that day. It wasn't anything special of a day, but um, finding this and I took some time to photograph it. The light was kind of really nice. And um, sometimes it's more about just getting a picture of a fish. So, um, with that, a couple uh, a couple of things. Um, I, I, I don't think it's going to happen this year with COVID and things like that. Um, but I am planning next year to put on um, at least one like kind of weekend photo clinic. Um, so if you if that's something you're interested in, kind of keep an eye out um, on kind of my social media or if you if you're uh, on my email list, you can get on the email list by going to my website, blackerthangling.com. And at the bottom, there's a there's an area you can sign up. Um, it's got a lot of good imagery in it, and I usually take a lot of time to put um, useful information in there. So if you're not signed up for that, and you want to know kind of more about what's going on, and and you know see images from um, you know the different trips we do. Um, anytime I go on a trip, I usually do a photo recap in that newsletter. Uh, I send out usually I try to do one a month. Once things get in full swing, guiding I usually don't make that that benchmark and maybe once every other month. Uh, but if it's something that you, you wanna see more of, um, certainly uh, go sign up for that. Uh, my Instagram is where I put up most of my content now. Um, it's just a really nice platform. Uh, there's Black Earth Angling Co is one of them. And then I have, I just started a personal one, um, which is just at Kyle Zempel. And uh, you can give that a follow. Uh, that's where I'm putting out more of my maybe less fishy stuff and, and just more travel photography or just stuff I find interesting. Some of my, more of my uh, work that's been sitting on a hard drive for a long time and uh, needs to just be seen by people. So I'll be kind of just bleeding out some Im images that way. And um, yeah, lastly, I mean, I, I, I appreciate you guys uh, hanging in here. 130 participants. That's pretty darn impressive. Um, I imagine there's some questions to be answered, so I'll, I'll kind of get to that and uh, get out of this, uh, this screen here. So let's see what we got. Yeah, if you, if you have any, uh, any questions, either feel free to, to unmute yourself and chime in or just, or just write them down here in this, in this chat box. Hey, Kyle. Um, yeah. So I've been taking notes as you've been going along. So I've got a ton of questions lined up for you if you want to do a lightning round. Um, Let's do it. Before we get into that, I just want to say thank you from on behalf of Wisconsin Trial Unlimited and all of us who participated. That was a great um, presentation you made. It, it shows us a different side of angling and, uh, and gives us something else to think about while we're out on the water. So appreciate you sharing your insights with us. Um, we'll start with some easy ones. So what, what model iPhone are you using right now? Uh, I think I have, ooh, that's a good question. iPhone 11, I think it's got the, it, it doesn't have the three. It has just the two lenses. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, I find actually, yeah, that, that wide, like the new, the new cameras that they're coming out with now have like those multiple uh, lenses. Uh, those things are really slick. Um, I think one of the things that, that was a drawback for the iPhone for me was um, it didn't have a wide enough angle image. I really like sometimes wide angles. And uh, now that that has it, like I find myself leaving my camera behind more and more often. So, yeah. Have you ever used a GoPro? I have. Yep. I used to use them a lot. Um, I just, I got to the point where I didn't have one that was kind of new enough um, and uh, found myself just kind of stockpiling a bunch of images away and not getting to them. Um, so it was just something I kind of phased out. Okay. Um, somebody had a question about your advice for solo anglers. Um, I think you did a pretty good job covering that in the, in the presentation. I love the tip about, you know, setting up your cell phone, putting it on video mode and like taking a video so that you could, um, you know, that you could go back and kind of find the best frame. That's, that's a really smart tip there. Yeah, that's um, a good anything one. else? Yeah, one more thing. So uh, this is something I, I forgot to mention. Um, <laughs> I, I don't do this anymore, um, but I, at one point I carried um, a selfie stick, which is kind of funny. Uh, however, one of the things that's really, you know, if you think about sticking uh, that, you, you don't want to buy an expensive one. You want the, like kind of the cheapest one you can have or make one yourself. Um, but one thing that's really nice is that we have that soft ground. A lot of times you can stick the selfie, the selfie stick just into the bank, just like you do that net. And you can kind of, uh, you know, adjust it just right. How you, how you think you're going to be. And then again, you can put it on video or, or put it on like burst or something like that, where you can take a bunch of images, lift your fish up, get a picture. And, uh, again, have some, some, it allows you to get away from the camera a little bit, which is nice. That's, that's an awesome tip. Yeah. I never thought about doing something like that. <laughs> so there's a couple of somewhat technical questions. So I'll maybe start with some of the easier ones and we'll, we'll maybe dive into a little bit of technical stuff. I don't know how wonky you want to get tonight, but um, here's a question about your macro shots. Is, are you zoomed in all the way when you're snapping the picture or do you go in and crop that later? Uh, I think all those images that you saw that were macro, like the eyeballs and, and the fins and stuff, that 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 was not cropped in. Um, I have there there is a number of images that I have cropped in, um, and maybe that's where like a higher resolution camera is helpful. Um, I do have a macro lens for my DSLR. It's a 100 millimeter, um, and it's it, it's fantastic. It's not. It's I find it's kind of hard to if you if you if you're just be taking one lens, you got to kind of go out. And again, most of the time when I'm doing macro stuff, I go out with the purpose that I'm doing macro shots today, right? And that's my mindset. And so that I'm looking for things and I'm, I'm not worried about taking pictures of anyone's fish. If that's the case, um, I'm gonna use my cell phone for that. Uh, so if I'm going out strictly dedicated to macro sh shooting, and I know they make some different lenses you can get for your, your cell phones um, that you can attach on there. And, and those things actually are all right. Like they, they, they zoom in nicely, so. It's amazing how far technology is coming. It really is. It's just crazy. So, are you on the are you on the auto mode at all? Your are you manual mode? What dial are you um, on? I like to shoot aperture mode a lot. That's the AV um, on your on your camera setting. Um, that one's nice because sometimes, again, when you when you're working quickly, um, if you're in full manual, you got to do a lot of adjusting of of both your aperture and your and your shutter speed. And I find myself making you know maybe making a mistake that I forgot to set one of them and then you end up with a black image or something like that or a blown out image. Um, and I, I like the aperture one because that's usually what I, if I, I'm trying to control my depth of field, if I'm shooting action, the opposite, the, I would probably use this, the shutter speed mode um, and uh, then set it to whatever shutter speed you want. Usually 800 or more is gonna, gonna stop something pretty nicely, uh, but yeah, so I'm 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 rarely in full auto. I'm I'm kind of in, um, you know, we could call it advanced auto in a way. Like it's it, it automatically adjusts your shutter speed if you're in aperture mode. You set the aperture, it sets the shutter speed for you. Um, so that's that's usually where I'm at. Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. And then uh, so that kind of leads into a couple other questions. Someone had asked if you had thoughts on like a, using a higher ISO, like bumping up your ISO versus slowing down your shutter speed. Um, yeah, that's are those, a, are those a, things you think about when you're out on the water? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a super good question. Um, you know, and it's something that I think about all the time. <clears throat> Here's my thought. Um, 
nobody likes a, I mean, unless you're going for that look, nobody likes a blurry image, right? So I'm gonna do whatever it takes to make sure that the image isn't blurry. Um, in low light situations, and I don't have, a, you know, most of the time we don't have a flash with us and a flash usually makes the, the image not very attractive again because it's, it's, it's direct at the, at the, at the subject. Um, so I'll crank that ISO, you know, way up. And, you know, there's, there's some, you know, if you work in Lightroom or any of these editing programs, there is some pro things you can run to, to reduce some of the noise because what happens is when you crank the ISO, things get a little grainy. Um, and if you go too far, it gets really grainy. Um, but again, I rather kind of have a still, or a, you know, an in-focus image than, than something that's blurry. So uh, that's that's something um, that I would, I would probably go more so pushing the ISO before I would slow my shutter speed down. Sure. Yeah, that's great. great you, should point. Allow, you should get to know like where you can hold steady enough. Um, mm. Usually I think, I mean, there's, there's like a rule of thumb. I don't know right off the top of my head, um, but there's like a rule of thumb of, of how far you're zoomed in and what your shutter speed should be, right? To, to oh handle. yeah, it doesn't matter on like your focal length, right? Yeah. Your shutter speed. Yeah, if like you're zoomed in more, like your shutter speed needs fraction to be of a second. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, that, that's that's good. Uh, one yep. thing is always when you're when you're trying to trying to shoot in low light, I like to exhale heavily and uh, and use like a burst. So like, you know, take like three, four, five images in a row. And a lot of times one of those will come out nice. Gotcha. Yeah, that's another great tip. Use the burst button. Just hold down that shutter and mm -hmm. let it fire off a couple so you have some options at the end. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit. Somebody was asking about how much post-processing you do or editing of the photo once you get back. And I know you mentioned Lightroom, which is one of the programs out there that a lot of photographers use to, to edit their images. Um, do you want to maybe just just take a minute and go through your process that you Yeah, use. absolutely. Um, so if I'm shooting my DSLR, generally I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to my, you know, my computer and I'm going to edit those, um, in light Adobe Lightroom. There's a, you know, for, for all of my outdoor adventure stuff, I'm rarely, rarely ever will I ever open up Photoshop. Um, I use Lightroom for pretty much everything. And obviously when I'm doing some of my wedding work or some of my commercial work, um, there's some things that need, need to be manipulated maybe a little bit. Um, that's when I'll go into Photoshop. But for the most part, this type of stuff, I'm using Lightroom. Um, you know, there's, you can, you know, you can buy or download a number of preset uh, packages. Um, I usually make all my own presets just because I have a certain look that I like um, and you can save them. And so I can just apply them to, you know, an image. Um, but I will also say that most of my imagery from my, my cell phone, which again is becoming more and more, um, the, you know, if you use Instagram, the, the little editing program that they have there is fantastic. I mean, it's really good. Um, you, they have the different filters, which are fine, but then you can also go in and like kind of manually do, you know, an edit on it. Um, I use that a lot. And uh, I think it works just fine. I mean, it's it's basically got all the stuff that you know. Uh, let's say a basic Lightroom would have. So I think yeah, the little uh, the little magic wand on the iPhone can can save a lot of pictures, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. It's amazing what what it can do. Um, yeah. So aside from aside from those technical moving the buttons and here and that, do you have any composition tips? that you could share with us? Are there, I know like basic general photography, there's kind of some general rules that that people try to abide by, but do you, do you play to any of those a little more? Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, um, my motto has always been um, when, I, when I was studying photography was learn the rules and then break them. Um, you know, that's, that's where interesting images come from is uh, broken rules. Um, but, but, you know, you know, if, you, if you're if you're interested in, in learning about composition, I, I just I urge you just to like um, Google, comp, you know, photo composition or I want to learn about photo composition, whatever. Um, and it, it'll basically you're going to see the same thing no matter what you come across. And that's kind of the rule of thirds. Right. So if I if I were to divide, uh, probably not going to be able to do it here. But if I were to divide my my frame up here, you'd have your third lines this way and then your third lines this way. Right. 
And things directly in the center generally aren't as interesting to the eye as something that's kind of at one of those cross points. So let's say this is the, this is would be the upper left third, I guess. The bottom, the bottom left there would be down here. Those intersecting points where those thirds meet um, is generally where things um, become more interesting to the eye. That's and where you put the fish's eye, right? When you want yeah. to have a picture. Yep, the same thing for the horizon. Don't put the horizon right in the middle of the camera, put it in the bottom or, you know, if you're trying to, if, if, the, if the sky is what you're trying to highlight, maybe put that, that horizon line at the bottom third. You know, if it's, you know, if it's a great sunrise and the light's hitting some frost on a tree really well, and you want to highlight kind of the stuff in front, maybe uh, put that horizon, you know, at the top third. But yeah, generally the, the rule of third is, is a good, um, is a good place to start, right? Someone just asked if shooting in raw mode was worthwhile. Mm. That's a tough question. Um, <laughs> for, me, for me, it is because my stuff will go to print occasionally. Um, if it's going to live digitally forever, um, I don't think it, it, the, the file sizes get very large. Um, and not to get kind of too nerdy on the whole thing and, and go down that rabbit hole. I mean, this is kind of some of the stuff I, I'll probably talk about in one of those, you know, photo seminar type of things because it can get really, really deep and, and heavy. Um, but just to, just to, to briefly cover that, right? So a JPEG capture is a, is a much smaller file size. There's a lot less information in that file, right? There's 256 colors. Um, in raw, there's like 256,000 colors that are captured in the in the the um, the the image size, you know, on your hard drive is is you know usually like 20 megabytes or something. It's it's like you know three times the size of a of a JPEG. Um, but the reason you shoot raw is it captures so much more data. So if you were to maybe really really underexpose something or um, yeah, usually it's underexposing something like you could probably pull out enough information and, and, and bring that photo kind of back to life. So unless you really know how, how to edit and, and handle those editing um, uh, programs, uh, I would say you probably don't need to be shooting in RAW, if that helps answer the question. Yeah, if yeah. you're really into editing and, and, and diving deep into that stuff, I would be shooting in RAW. And you don't have to necessarily shoot in like the, I know now cameras have like full RAW, and then they have like medium raw and then small raw and it's just the file sizes. Um, you can probably get away with some of the smaller stuff. Most things live in a digital world now. So you don't need to blow things up to the size of a billboard anymore. It's gonna be on the size of your cell phone. Uh, so, you know, take it as you will. It's, you know, at, at some point you're just filling up a hard drive space. Sure. All right, I got three quick questions for you. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the sand out of your camera gear on the lower <laughs> Wisconsin? Uh, luckily, Canon's got some really, really nice, um, you know, kind of sealing mechanisms, and, and I've been really happy with that. Um, I keep my camera in my boat in a Pelican case. Um, I'm pretty, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't treat my cameras the best, I would say. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty risky with them. I mean, uh, you know, and, and I think some of that is like, if you you can't capture a shot if your camera is not accessible. And so it needs to be somewhere where you can get at it. You know, uh, when I'm on the water, I like to use like um, a sling pack, like a waterproof sling pack. And the reason I like that is because I can quick sling it around and open it up and it's right in front of me uh, versus a backpack where I have to take the backpack off, get into it. Um, obviously if I'm going on like a, a longer trip where I can't get back to my car, um, you know, I may throw it in a, in a backpack because it's a little more secure. Um, but as far as keeping sand out, um, uh, I just try to keep it off the sand as much as possible. <laughs> cross your fingers, right? <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot right. of speed crossing. I don't right. really change lenses at all when I'm when I'm out in like on, on sand or anything like that. Uh, that's always done like you know, kind of in the boat or something like that. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. So. All right, two non-camera related questions here. What's the biggest brown trout you've ever caught in your life? Oh, geez. I, I don't, honestly, um, I'm not a person who really measures my fish at all. Like I, I probably don't know the length of really any of my fish. Um, to me, the, the number is not important. 
different at all. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the biggest brown I caught was in Chile. Um, on, uh, it was like the, the 11th hour. It was like the last, the, the last like 10 feet of the float and I cast in there and I caught it and it, it you know, totally made my day. And it was like this big heavy thing. And it was, it was a fantastic fish. Um, so that, that's awesome. That was the one. Yep. All right. Last question for the night. When are we doing drinking with scissors? I know, I know. Right. Um, I'm working right. I'm actually down here in my, my little makeshift studio. Uh, I'm doing, I'm going to release some YouTube videos. I've got some, some local tires, uh, that, um, I reached out to a while back about doing some videos and, um, we, we filmed and I'm um, putting them together now, but it'll be kind of like a, a YouTube series of like some, some how to tying videos. Um, obviously we can't meet as a group, um, yet. Um, so that, that's not going to happen, but, uh, I, have been rolling around the idea of doing a zoom one. I, I have a hard time picturing how it work, how it would work without it being like some sort of like a class where there's a, an instructor and, you know, and, and everyone kind of follows along. So, um, that, that, that's kind of where I'm at on that. You know, like I want to do a zoom one, but I think it'd be absolute mayhem if everyone's trying to talk, you know, and, and have a social, um, I don't think zoom is necessarily the greatest for, um, having a, a, a social, um, there needs to be some direction in it. Uh, if anyone wants to pitch me some ideas of how we can do it or, or wants to, you know, host a Zoom, um, I'm more than happy to, to, to uh, you know, jump, jump in and, and help, help out and, you know, make it a drinking with scissors. So I, I miss it. I miss it a lot. I really enjoyed those. I enjoyed seeing everybody around uh, who can make it. And uh, it's, it's one of the harder things I've had to, had to deal with this winter. So. so we still have a number of people on, and I just realized that many of them probably are not from the Madison area. And so... Do you want to maybe explain what drinking with scissors is just so sure, you and I don't sure, sound yeah. crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I kind of forget that as well. Um, yeah, so uh, drinking is, with scissors is, a, is, a, is an event I came up with a number of years ago. And it's, there's no, it's, it's not a class. It's not a tying class. It's, a, it's, a, it's strictly a social event to get people out of their winter dens, face to face, talking and tying. And you can tie whatever you want. You don't have to tie at all. You can just come and socialize. Um, and usually there's there's beer at the place that we all meet. Um, so drinking with scissors. And uh, and it, it just become this really, really great community building thing. Um, I think it really shows how, how great of a fishing community um, is out there. And there's a lot of faces. Like every, every it seemed like every event, there was new faces that, you know, nobody had ever seen before. Um, and so I think, I think it was just a really, really good thing for for our area to uh, get people together and actually I've, I've, I've over the course of the winter I've heard uh, I think of at least three different people who met someone at drinking with scissors and now ha have become good fishing friends um, so I mean to, to me that's like the ultimate victory and the reason I was doing it in the first place so uh, I'm, su I'm super happy to, to hear that stuff um, but uh, again if you uh, if you follow along on any of my stuff, uh, I will be releasing some YouTube um, kind of tying tutorials um, with the drinking with scissors theme. And, uh, you know, it'll kind of run through just some people's favorite flies. There's already some videos out there. If you go to YouTube and drinking with scissors, uh, it should pop up for you or just go to YouTube and search Black Earth Angling Co. And uh, my channel will come up and you can find it there. Um, the, so just to give you a little insight, not to, not to go too long here, but, uh, I mean, I, I got nowhere to be. So, um, some, some insight there. Um, one of the things that I, I always was bothered by as a, as a fly tire is how long fly tying videos could be. Right. And, uh, I think like, you know, like a, Kelly Gallup was like, I feel like one of the Kings of it. He like the 25 minute long videos to tie, you know, uh, you know, uh, whatever, right? It was, it, this, there's so long. And I just want to like, I kind of like, like if, you, if you have a little bit of background knowledge on tying, like, I just want to like, let's, let's get through this thing. I want to see what's next. And so you don't have to kind of scroll through the video, which ends up, you know, you scroll too far and then you're scrolling back and it's just hard to do. Uh, so the idea of my drinking with scissors videos was that I was going to kind of, um, they're kind of elaborate videos to put together because I, I, I film it, I film the person tying real time. And then chop it all up and I speed up the stuff that's not important, right? So if we're going to say, all right, we're going to 
put some thread on the hook, right? We're going to speed that up because we all know how to put thread on the hook, right? And we don't, we don't need to, to take all the time to do that. So um, the, 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 the idea is that the videos are kind of short and concise um, with some, you know, I would say there may be a little bit of a, I want to say a beginner because it helps to have a little background knowledge in fly tying, right? If you have some background knowledge, you should really like these videos. And um, again, I, I, I still have some more that I want to get put out, but they should be coming out here. And I think the next one will, the first one will come out next week. So. That's for, great. Can't wait to see that stuff. So it's exciting that we're, we're continuing to build that community, even though we are dealing with the, you know, the pandemic that we're dealing with. So hopefully there's some light at the end of the tunnel and, uh, and we'll get through this. So um, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate appreciate having you on. Um, if anybody out there has not yet had the pleasure of fishing with Kyle, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's a top notch. It's a top notch game that he's pitching out there. So um, the lower Wisconsin, especially, is just a tremendous fishery. And then um, you've obviously got trout camps and, and different types of of trips set up to to cater to different folks. So it's great to see. And uh, thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and if I can make one uh, a little pitch too, um, yeah, uh, ch please go to my website. Um, there's been a lot of time and effort that goes into that thing, and uh, check out what's going on. Um, I I have added one of the newest additions. I, I added a, we added a new camp. We call it Frogs and Footballs. Uh, it's it's in kind of the later part of the summer, August, and um, it's kind of like all the great things about Crash Camp. It, it, Crash Camp is kind of a you know, on the river intense sort of thing, a multi-day fishing trip, but, you know, you're staying in a tent, which I realize isn't for everyone, but, you know, kind of finding a, another option was, was a challenge. I found that option. And uh, now we have this frogs and footballs, which um, this thing is uh, about three, four years in the making now. And I think I've pretty much pinned down um, when this frog migration happens. And if you like top water and fishing frogs or bass, this thing is awesome. Uh, and this time period is awesome. So take a look into that. Um, and then uh, for all of you who like trout fishing, I, I put together a trout camp. Um, you know, if you're maybe new to, to trout fishing and want a couple of days of instructions, this is a really good option. Uh, you get back, you know, back to back guided days, you know, food and fun and you get to fish with other people. And uh, it's just a, it's a good thing. Um, so, so check those things out. Again, a lot of time and effort goes in, in, into those things and thoughts. So uh, yeah, I uh, I thank you so much. This is this is great. I really like that you guys are doing this, and uh, um, thank you all for for tuning in uh, and listening to me ramble on for for an hour here. <laughs> That's so. awesome. Thanks, Kyle. I'll end it with this. If anybody's interested to know what a social fly tank event looks like on Zoom, our own Jason Freund is kind of uh, putting one together this Saturday night. So um, the theme is is Wisconsin flies. So they're going to kind of have a couple of speakers who will kind of feature and, and kind of guide us through the evening, but you're welcome to just join in and check it out. And we'll talk about some of the history of some of those famous Wisconsin flies like the, the Hornberg and the Pass Lakes and maybe the Llama or some of that other stuff that has a Wisconsin background to it. So it should be pretty fun. You can see the, find the link on our, on our website for that. So thanks again, Kyle, really appreciate it. Have a great night, yeah. man. And if I didn't answer any questions here, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. I, I'm happy to answer them, so. Excellent. I know this is a lot of people here and, uh, you know, we didn't probably didn't get to everything that everyone was, was wanting, but, uh, open, I'm an open book. So feel free to shoot me a message. So that sounds With that, great. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night.